Welcome to Too Cool for God. I'm here with my co-host J.P. Hutton and Dr. Shane Calhoun. We have a very specific guest for this podcast. This is a second in a series, and I'd like to welcome you both. Uh, Dr. Shane Calhoun, I know you're a busy guy, and thank you so much for, for joining us. J.P. Hunton, you've known Shane for a long time. I'll let you do the introduction. Thanks, Don. Uh, yeah, Shane is a longtime friend of mine, and um, our last conversation kind of led to this. Shane, how are you, Dr. Shane? I'm wonderful, and I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Good. It's, it's great to have you, and thank you for joining us. Um, Shane, you are... Correct me if I uh, make sure I got this right. You're the staff psychologist at Humboldt State University, and you also uh, do seminars and have a private practice, and your emphasis is on neurodiversity and wellness. Is that correct? Or holistic wellness, right? Yes, that's right. Would you take a moment to explain to us what neurodiversity and wellness is? Yeah, neurodiversity is uh, any brain that doesn't operate the way you would think of as a neurotypical brain to operate. So that includes ADHD, that includes autism, and, uh, and learning disabilities, any, any way that the brain might operate um, in contrast or not quite centered uh, in, in comparison to a uh, normal functioning brain. And it's important to to, to call it neurodiversity as opposed to just singling out ADHD or autism because it's, uh, it's the time in our culture where we really need to start thinking about neurodiversity as its own culture. Um, uh, Can you expand on that? A time in our culture to talk about neurodiversity as its own culture. What does that mean? Yes. Um, so if you think of our society as having uh, kind of a many boxes of acceptability. There is, are rules around what makes somebody have the right kind of conversation, uh, the right kind of eye contact, to be able to pay attention in class the right way, to learn math the right way. And we have all of these things that are the right way of doing things. And, uh, and the world actually is, it uses these boxes to uh, judge people as being worthy of attention, support, love. Um, and it's also used to judge people and ostracize and marginalize people when they don't fit quite in the middle of these boxes. And the definition of, of neurodiversity is that we don't fit neatly into all of these boxes. And it's really hard for uh, a neurotypical person to understand the needs of somebody who doesn't fit inside of these boxes. And does ADHD uh, come into play with a lot of what you do? Is that the, the root of this? Yes. So, so think of it this way. If your whole life you have experienced a sense of being othered, you're not quite learning the right way. You're not holding a conversation quite the right way. Your eye contact isn't quite right. Um, whenever you're talking about something, uh, whatever has the most dopamine, whatever has the most interest is where your mind goes. So you jump topics quickly. And that makes uh, a neurotypical person maybe feel uh, less connected. Or in worst case scenario, it actually makes it legitimate for them to judge and dislike an other uh, a neurodiverse person. Um, so oh. if that's been happening your whole life, you have developed what's called rejection sensitivity. 90% hmm. of neurodiverse individuals have what's called rejection sensitivity syndrome, which means whenever we are faced with an ambiguous situation where we think a person might not like us or they're outright judging us, or, uh, or we aren't liked by somebody, um, it actually carries a, a deep pain. It's, it's, there's a deeper level of suffering and it's really hard for a neurotypical person to understand the sensitivities and the struggles of what it takes for a neurodiverse person to fit into these boxes. And it's, we're able to do that for short periods of time sometimes. 
but there's a deep emotional cost to us. Shane, I heard you say we're able to and us. Yes. Um, I, would you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I am, uh, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. So I consider myself part of the neurodiverse community. And when I was first diagnosed, uh, suddenly it made a lot of sense, uh, a lot of my struggles in life. Um, because I'd always felt like there was something wrong that if I could just figure out what that thing was, that I could fix it. And uh, when I was diagnosed, I was given a long list of things that I could do to fix it. Mm. And none of those things worked. Um, I had a hard time paying attention. And the recommendation was, well, pay attention better. I had a hard time learning the way other people learn. And so the advice was, well, you just got to figure out how to learn better. And so I was left with a deep sense of, okay, now I know where I have this, this area of growth, but I don't know what to do about it. And that led me into this field of studying, what is it that we can do? And there is a lot we can do. Uh, and, and, and actually the church, is a place that actually provides the context, the rich context where a lot of neurodiverse individuals actually can get their needs met. When society has these boxes of acceptability that are often used to marginalize and judge, a church that, that truly adheres to the principle of non-judgment and love that actually makes space for the neurodiverse community. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be here today, to be able to talk about what those needs are uh, and how the church is actually, you know, doing a really great job of making that space and, and the consequences of what happens when, when they fail to do that. So what's it like to be a Christian in an academic uh, setting uh, these days? And uh, how, do you, how does that, how, how do you transfer that to your, to your students, to your... Uh, uh, patients. Well, uh, first, you just consider the, the boxes of acceptability, right? Um, and, uh, and that's what society uses to, to judge whether or not somebody is uh, worthy of support or worthy of being judged and ostracized. Mm -hmm. And uh, when society sees the church as actually operating in the same system as having all these boxes of judgment, that they are indiscriminately putting out on the world. And that's the narrative that the world maintains as a way to keep themselves safe, as a way to be able to continue uh, judging Christianity uh, and, and being able to hold on to that, that narrative that Christianity is oppressive. Um, uh, they have to be able to maintain this idea of Christians as judgmental. And when you step away from that, and when Christians allow themselves to enter into love thy neighbor and and this this uh, and manifest that non judgment, it robs society of that narrative. And so, yes, there is a danger in academics uh, of uh, saying that you are Christian, um, but when you demonstrate non judgment and acceptance, it contrasts that narrative, and that becomes. A, you become the exception. And when there are enough exceptions to that judgment, that's when people can't sustain that judgment towards the church anymore. And so that's what shows up for me. That's my role in academics is to first establish that I'm less of this, you know, waffle of, you know, boxes of judgment and more like a pancake, you know, that non-judgment, that love, and, uh, and when I can, you know, see somebody's experience, and this is the cool thing about being uh, somebody who uh, ascribes to the neurodiverse culture, is I don't see um, a, uh, a problem like maybe an anger problem or uh, conflict difficulty as uh, oppressive. I see it as, um, you know, there's a need. And I just got to figure out what that need is. And there is some reason why they have that and that's showing up and I can be non-judgmental towards that. And that shows up in my work with clients. You know, if you don't like somebody, it's because you don't understand where their coping strategies come from, where their pain and suffering comes from that makes those coping strategies the right coping strategy. And when you understand that 
in a non-judgmental, compassionate way, you can join and you can come up with new coping strategies. You can create wow. healing. And that is, is just the thing that the churches that truly adhere to those, those principles of love and the teaching of Christ, um, that's what they offer. Wow, Shane. That's, thank you for that. Um, I want to bring you back to the idea of the, the neurodiverse community. You call it a community. You identify as a member of this community. Tell me about the community. So if you look at society with its, its all of its judgments and you know what it means to be the right kind of male and the right kind of female, and, and uh, it, it's just very taxing on uh, anybody who doesn't fit into those boxes. And so we have to engage in what's called masking. Masking is something that makes us appear neurotypical, but it costs us energy. And when somebody gets to know us, they get to know the mask. And so there's less connection. Wow. Okay. That brings up a lot of things. Yeah. So are we masking? It, That's the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I being authentic? Am I being who I am supposed to be? Right. And uh, exactly. And that, that's a lifelong discovery. Uh, you mentioned ADHD, ADHD in yourself. What, so what was the fix and what, what is it for others? And is, is there a, a time period you're, you're shooting for? Uh, I guess what I'm saying is, what do you do for ADHD in yourself and others? So, so I mean, let, let's, let me take this to a concrete example. Um, somebody's having a hard time paying attention during a worship service. It's maybe it's overstimulating, it's loud, um, they're not really paying attention, maybe the music doesn't speak to them. Well, with ADHD, you learn best with movement, right? That's, that's a different way of learning uh, from a neurotypical person who learned best by sitting and, and listening and paying attention. Well, the research shows that cardiovascular exercise moving around the room, being active is actually a much more effective way to help somebody with ADHD learn. So what do you do in church? You give the kid an instrument. You let them walk around the room. You, you do ecotherapy and get them out in nature and you do your, your Bible studies on hikes. You go to summer camp. These are things that build camaraderie, that allow acceptance, that uh, make space for having different needs. And when they are made to sit and pay attention the way everybody else learns and, uh, and they can't do that, they're gonna lose interest in church. But if they're handed an instrument, now they have this rich, meaningful way to connect, right? And so if they're up walking around, if they're moving around, that's not them being disinterested, that's them trying to listen and participate. So whenever we see that, being able to say, okay, there's a need there, not, oh, there's disinterest. There is uh, there's a need and we need to trust this person when they say, this is what I need. And with the neurotypical community, if they're up walking around and they say, I need to, to walk and go outside, we assume that there's an ulterior motive. With the neurodiverse community, there are very few ulterior motives. They're stating what they need and they do need that. And so that's why it's its own culture to, to speak to what you were talking about, uh, JP. Um, it's its own culture because it's very hard for a neurotypical person to understand the needs of somebody who is neurodiverse. And there are communication barriers. There are, it's, it's a different culture. When you get a neurotypical and a neurodiverse person together and they have communication, it misses often. But when you get uh, even an autistic and, and uh, an ADHD person together and they start communicating, it turns out that those communication barriers go away. So the solution in society is to, to get one society to be less judgmental and more accepting, um, which is you know, a thing that we're always working on, um, but also just to get the neurodiverse community together to help them understand that they're a part of a culture and that they can support each other. And when you get them all together, the, the, the richness shows up the meaningful connection is there they can unmask 
and space is made for each other's needs and they can meet each other's needs in a more genuine way. And, uh, and again, I wanna bring this back to the church that the church does that. The church does that accidentally in many ways. Uh, it, just by nature of following God's design for the church, it creates a space for neurodivergence, for the neurodiverse community to come and find acceptance, to unmask a little bit. I like that term, wow. unmask. Have you wow. always been a Christian? Yeah, yeah, I, I've been a Christian uh, since as far as I can remember. Yeah. Well, Shane, I, you talk I, about the church accidentally accommodating the uh, neurodiverse community. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about how the church is intentionally uh, accommodating the neurodiverse community. And I think that brings us to uh, your seminars and workshops that you're doing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the seminars and workshops that you do, uh, where you do them, how you do them, and um, what they're all about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I do a lot of my workshops at in university settings, um, but I also do a lot in the community as well. Um, and uh, this kind of speaks to uh, the, the initial question about wellness. So when you think of wellness and, and holistic wellness, uh, it, it's usually we think of balance. And this is where the neurochemistry comes into play. With ADHD specifically, when you pay attention, blood flow restricts to your executive functioning areas of your brain, your frontal lobes, and it gets a little bit harder to pay attention to things. And so you get lower dopamine. So dopamine is something that's, it's your motivation. It's your attention. It's your ability to hold multiple things in your head at the same time. And so you need that dopamine to fuel your executive functioning part of your brain. Um, and so a lot of my workshops are how to boost dopamine in the short run. Um, so novelty, for instance. So if you're talking to a very boring professor and they're slow and quiet, the dopamine is gonna drop. But suddenly if their voice inflection changes, that caused you to wake up just now. That's because your brain produces dopamine with new things, new situations, novelty, releases dopamine. So we call that a short-term intervention. So there's things like getting around people. People are dopamine agonists. They, uh, they help you release dopamine and pay attention if you're just around others. Uh, uh, novelty in the short run and long run, um, like taking vacations once a year, it actually kind of increases your brain's capacity to produce dopamine. Um, and uh, intensity. So if you're at the right level of intensity, and you see this a lot in video games, uh, video games put your, your, your brain to work at the perfect level of intensity, and that makes your brain produce a ton of dopamine. And that's why uh, somebody with attention problems can sit and play video games for you know 12 hours straight and be perfectly fine, right? So, so it's like using those strategies to be able to increase attention span in the short run. And then you have your long-term interventions of creating balance. And usually this is what we sacrifice whenever we're under stress or we're busy, we sacrifice our serotonin. And serotonin is an antidepressant and a stimulant, and it helps regulate your dopamine. So serotonin you get with good food, good sleep, and good connection with people. If you have good community, your brain creates a buffer against stress and it increases your ability to pay attention in class. So when we're looking at what wellness is, it's short-term interventions and it's long-term interventions and serotonin interventions, they don't work for a couple of weeks, right? You get into a good community, you start building friends, you might feel better because that you know, increases your dopamine, you're having adventures, you're having novelty, but your brain will reorganize itself around this new chemical balance. And suddenly it becomes much more capable of handling stress, of handling the, the pressures of life. You can be lonely for a little bit and your body won't react the same way. It's like, it's okay because you trust that you have community. 
And again, that's that's something we find in the church. And you asked what what is the church doing intentionally? It's providing community. It's providing stability. It's providing non-judgment and connection. And simply by following and pursuing that, uh, we make space for a diverse range of, of brain functioning and brain needs and relational needs. And essentially we create balance and stability in life. Wow. Has the church changed? A lot of people left the church, God, you know, everything in search, you know, maybe through meditation, yoga, uh, and everything else I've been through around the world at uh, monasteries. I have a feeling there's a there's a movement back to Christianity. Yeah, you know, and, so this this is uh, the dilemma, right? Because the church does need to be discerning on how to set boundaries and create wellness in its community. And, uh, and sometimes we slip and that kind of gets over more into the realm of judgment because we're human and we make mistakes. And when that happens, people feel that, they feel that loss of community. We lose out on the rich things that the church has to offer in terms of community and life balance and wellness. And there are alternatives. So I always recommend meditation as a practice to my clients because it exercises. Meditation exercises a pathway to the left frontal lobe where non-judgment lives. It makes it easier to be less judgmental towards yourself and others when you have exercised that pathway. And meditation is simply a practice to be able to, to engage that in yourself and develop that skill. So yeah, absolutely. Also, um, it helps with a neurodiversity because you become aware of your needs a little bit better and you're able to articulate your needs better. When you're aware, you have a better introceptive awareness uh, and awareness of what your emotions are at any given moment. It also helps you become aware of your attention shifts. So if you're not paying attention, you actually notice that you're not paying attention uh, and you can do something about it. So yeah, meditation is very powerful. And, and the, the world has all these really great pragmatic coping strategies that the church thinks it's in competition with. And, and if you look at the science and the research and understand the Bible, we don't have to be afraid of that. Oh, Shane, I love that you agree. Said, don't agree. have to be totally. afraid of that. I think Don and I, um, just to speak for myself, I think we're very aligned with that idea. And what, you know, when you're talking, I'm hearing you talking about non-judgment. I'm talking, you're talking about community. You're talking about even so much as giving a kid a tambourine, right? Giving them an instrument, getting them moving. And I think um, some of the things that we do at church, that Christians do at church, are uh, are the, these motions that we do, right? They're very healthy. They're very good for us. The gathering, the, the, the coffee time on the patio, the, the music is not just meant to put us, you know, kind of lift our mood, but the, the doing of the music together, the, the, the breathing and the singing. And, you know, we're called to prayer and meditation, but, but and we have moments of silence and those sorts of things. And I think uh, it's really interesting to hear you talking about the value of those things. I think sometimes we are being told, you know, don't just go to church and go through the motions. And what I like to say is the motions have meaning. Do the motions. The motions have a lot of value. I, you know, like, I think that, um, I, I think we're aligned on this. It's really nice to talk to you about it and to talk about, I like that you say that the church is accidentally doing those things. I think in some ways in our, in our ancient church traditions, they were built in on purpose. It's that the contemporary church has just focused on uh, very typical things, mm. very on purpose, almost trying to prescribe typical things. And that we are so uh, diverse that we are the hands, the feet, the eyes. There's even biblical literature to discuss how we all are so very different, so diverse, and yet we make the body, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, so, uh, it's so dangerous to conceptualize our Christianity by understanding what the world is and, and creating an us versus them as a way to define ourselves and get to know ourselves. And that is, it's a scary way to go about it, right? Because then you, you history shows that when, when the church pits itself against something and then it turns out that there's some merit in, in science 
for instance, uh, we end up looking bad, you know? And, and so we don't have to be afraid of those things. We don't have to pit ourselves against that. There are certain things that aren't in our, in our value system. And yeah, we, we don't jump on board with those. Um, but uh, being able to make space and, and define ourselves with what we are, as opposed to what we're not, is, is really important. And that means non-judgment, right? Yeah. Well, Don, I think we might be reaching the end of our time together, but is there anything else you want to ask my friend Shane? I mean, Dr. Shane Calhoun. Well, I was just thinking that, you know, we're in the midst of this big reset and that how many people left the church when they were young because mom made them go or some relationship that went terribly off the tracks back when they were 15, 10, 20. And, you know, all those years I was away from the church, hence the name of the show, Too Cool for God. That was me, Too Cool for School, you know, and all I accomplished, and I came back in my early 60s to the church, all I, looking back, all I did was deny myself great friends, all these great relationships and healthy people, but the church has changed. It is pretty cool. There's a lot of pretty cool people in that are Christians uh, nowadays. So it's it's not your mom's uh, church anymore. It's it needs to be rediscovered. Uh, I know my mom's pretty cool though. <laughs> there's some cool moms even. Yeah. So <laughs> just kidding. So uh, anyway, I want to thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, uh, Shane, for being here. And uh, we'll talk to you again. And let's wrap it up here. Too cool for God. Thanks very much.